for you. All right, thanks, Carter. So I'll start off and hand over to Tom, I'll set my timer so that I don't go over his time. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a bit today about the uh, John A. Galt 26 meter telescope here at ERAO and some post upgrade opportunities. We're in the middle of a big upgrade of that telescope. And so first slide here, radio astronomy, what is it? Well, 7.10 PM, September 16th, 1932, this fellow here, his name is Carl Jansky. He's working for the Bell Telephone Labs trying to understand why inter, uh, well, cross-Atlantic telephone signals are getting disturbed. He discovers by the, you building this big antenna and moving it around that, uh, that the lightning storms and thunderstorms in the area were disrupting telephone calls. But he also saw something at this time on this day for the first time that led him to, uh, to discover what we now know as radio astronomy. Uh, these radio waves he was looking at were about 20 megahertz on the radio dial. So that's the off the left edge of your car radio. And that corresponds to about 14 meters. He didn't quite know what he was seeing, but he saw that there was this disturbance that occurred every 23 hours and 56 minutes. He was talking to an old friend of his from the University of Wisconsin who had taken an astronomy class and said, oh, don't you know, 23 hours and 56 minutes, that's the sidereal rate, not the solar rate. Whatever you're looking at must be coming from out of space. And shortly after New York Times, we see that Jansky has discovered radio waves coming from the Milky Way. When we look up at the Milky Way on a dark night, we see lots of stars. And if you're really far out, you can see that those stars are obscured by dark dust lanes. And that dust prevents us from seeing all the stuff behind it. Well, turns out we're lucky because there are physical processes out in space, such as synchrotron radio emission, where you can have uh, fast moving particles like electrons that can spiral around magnetic fields in, space, in interstellar space, and they emit radio photons. So here's a picture of what the sky looks like from this uh, broadband continuum radio emission uh, at 408 megahertz. And so these radio waves are so long in wavelength, they go right through all that dust. And so it's a way to probe the universe and our own Milky Way through all of the uh, obscuring dust. And uh, we're lucky to have that mechanism at our disposal. Uh, another method that allows us to probe beyond the dusty regions of our galaxy uh, comes from the, uh, the abundant hydrogen atom. Turns out that every now and then, over a very long period of time, the spins of the electron and proton in a hydrogen atom can swap their orientations. And when they do that, uh, a, a, a photon can be emitted or absorbed. And when emitted, the wavelength of that uh, light is 21 centimeters long, coming in on your radio dial at 1420 megahertz. And so those, uh, that emission can be seen all across the sky. And so in between the stars, here's some different positions towards the sky. And you can see you can get intensity of the radio emission as well as the frequency. And its shift from 1420 megahertz tells you how fast and potentially uh, how distant the uh, hydrogen atom was when it emitted or broadcasted that radio wave. And so we see 21 centimeter radio emission everywhere in the sky that we look. And not only do we get the brightness, but we can also get uh, various distances or velocities towards these hydrogen atoms. It's a very powerful tool for us to probe uh, the Milky Way and beyond. So Canada wanted to get into the game when that was discovered in the 1950s. And so in 1957, uh, the Dominion Observatory and the National Research Council went around Canada looking for the best places to build an observatory. Uh, they also went through the United States and looked at comparable places where they knew radio telescopes were going to be built. Here they are in Penticton in 1957. And they compared the uh, results of the, the radio scene, the interference from things like spark plugs in cars between, say, on the left, the White Lake Observatory, the White Lake Basin, where out in Penticton, British Columbia, and on the right, 
in Green Bank, West Virginia, where the United States National Radio Quiet Zone was. And even back then, before either site had been built, uh, the Penticton site was quieter than the US National Radio Quiet Zone. So that became the place that the observatory was built. A 26 meter telescope was purchased and designed and uh, brought out to the site. And here's early February, 1959. It was begun to be assembled in the spring after everything had melted. Here's the tower being erected and a bunch of bridge cranes that were going to help assemble. Here's the fully assembled 26 meter dish with a car and children for reference. And here's the, the dish being uh, brought up to the tower and assembled. So all of that work was done by June uh, 1960. And on the 20th of that month, the observatory was officially opened for business. And since that time, this, this actually goes through May of 2020, we assembled all of the papers that we could that mentioned uh, or used data from the 26 meter. So uh, not mentioned, they, they used the data from the 26 meter telescope. So we were able to accumulate about uh, 363. There's probably more, but uh, there's the distribution over that uh, 60 year time range. And some of the highlights there, some of the ones out, these are just cherry picked. Uh, as I went through, uh, I thought it was interesting, you know, back uh, in 1968, the very first published use of the word pulsar showed up using the 26 meter uh, by John Galt and Ann Gower uh, making measurements of pulsars using that dish. Um, uh, another big result was uh, a large survey of continuum emission uh, from at 1420 megahertz in the northern sky by John Galt and Kennedy. Uh, it's probably most famous for its use in, uh, in, in proving the technique of long baseline interferometry. Uh, here's the, the 26 meter and here's a 46 meter telescope in Algonquin National Park. And they were both used together in 1967 to uh, for the first time simultaneously using telescopes that weren't directly connected by a cable. And that's a very long story how they did that, but uh, it ended up in a couple of nature papers where they demonstrate the technique using a 3,074 kilometer baseline. Uh, and then some science came out of that actually measuring the diameter of some quasars, which at the time there was a question, what are these things? Are they really stellar light sources that are points or can, we, can they be uh, resolved into larger structures? What exactly are these things? So that, uh, that technique, is used extensively today, and uh, there's now a plaque that lives on the uh, on the telescope. The, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers gave the 2010 Milestone Award to the development of that technique. Um, pretty heady stuff. It's uh, also been given to the laser, the compact disc, uh, the internet, and pacemakers. They they think that this was an engineering feat on par with those. Uh, also won a, a big gold medal sitting in the Canadian Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa from the United States American Academy of Arts and Sciences. This big gold medal was only given to two Canadians or, or teams over its history, and this was one of them. Uh, some other, uh, some other uh, developments were uh, the first long baseline interferometer measurements of pulsars. Uh, and in doing that uh, in the 1970s, uh, it was discovered that these pulsars were scintillating. So the, inter the ionized interstellar medium uh, between us and the pulsar was affecting the signal and causing them to scintillate. So there was a lot that could be learned about the interstellar medium that way. Some other highlights include looking at hydroxyl molecule emission from comets and a large scale uh, survey of the 21 centimeter emission in the Milky Way galactic plane, but carefully attributing the contribution from the instrument itself. Uh, so that these were some highlights. And recently it's played a key role in the holographic mapping 
of the beam of the chime telescope. So here's the results for the Pathfinder. That's actually a picture of big chime, but it plays a critical role in understanding uh, the instrumental response and beam of that telescope so that the chime results can be corrected. The next couple of topics as we discuss, discuss involve polarization. And so in case you're uninitiated, I thought I'd give you a very brief description. If you just look at a, a light bulb in your ceiling, the light coming from your light bulb or your LED is not uh, polarized. The electric field at any given time is totally random and moving around. Uh, but there are some things in nature that create polarized uh, radiation. In fact, if you looked, uh, you know, if you look around on, on, see on the roofs of your neighboring houses, there may be still some remnant antennas that picked up television signals, and those have these dipoles all aligned in a plane, and they would emit or receive uh, radiation that has its electric field preferentially along one plane. Uh, electric fields can also rotate in time as they move through space, and that type of polarization is circular. And so here's an example over here of an antenna that has a helical uh, helical antenna design that picks up circular polarization. And that polarization can, can be right-handed rotating in one direction or left-handed rotating in the other. So uh, I'll just br briefly mention, if you go on to ADS or archive, uh, a, a, an article or chapter in a handbook that just was published uh, I've written a, a description about everything you'd ever want to know about polarization, specifically in single dish radio astronomy. And a key point there is that the in radio astronomy, you may have a receiver that will pick up two orthogonal modes of radiation. For instance, you may have oscillations vertically and horizontally, and your receiver will pick up those two independent electric fields or voltages. And you can combine those two orthogonal polarizations in a way to create what, what astronomers, but physicists, it's not astronomers use the tool, but it's a physics concept and engineering concept as well. Uh, there are four Stokes parameters. And these are just a measure of power and specifically how much power resides in the tendency to be linearly aligned or circularly aligned. So if you add a, a signal that had a bunch of power in Stokes I, but no power in Q, U, and V, it would be a totally randomly or randomly polarized signal. If it was 100%, uh, if the, the, the intensity in Stokes I was the same as Stokes V, it would mean all of your, um, uh, all of your emission was in uh, circular polarization. And if there was no V, but some Q and U, it'd be linearly polarized. So these are just uh, tools that we use to describe polarization, the Stokes parameters. So you can go to this chapter and learn all about the nitty gritty details. So back in 1845, Michael Faraday discovered Faraday rotation. You can have a linearly polarized source that's emitting and it has a preference, let's say in the vertical direction. And it goes through an ionized magnetized medium and it will rotate the, prefer the preferred electric orientation. And it does that differently for different frequencies. And so if you measure the amount of the polarization angle change as a function of frequency or wavelength, uh, you can actually measure what we call a rotation or Faraday rotation measure. That tells you something about the ionized density and magnetic field in the medium between the, the source that's polarized and the telescope. And so the 26 meter was involved in six years of data collection in a project called the Global Magneto-Ionic Medium Survey. And so this was measuring the amount of that Faraday rotation uh, throughout the entire Northern sky. So here we see a little movie that shows you what the rotation measure was, that is the the combination or product of the ionized density and the magnetic field uh, as a function of position. And so uh, Tom may have more to say about that later, but uh, the, this sort of work will continue on the 26 meter. Uh-oh, I'm frozen. Can you guys hear me again? It seems like I froze up. I can hear you. Yep. Good, good, okay. Excellent. Um, 
So uh, one thing that we would very much like to do with the 26 meter is study the Zeeman effect. Um, magnetic fields can leave a little fingerprint on uh, in the circular polarization uh, or Stokes V of spectral line emission. So spectral lines like the 21 centimeter uh, line from hydrogen atoms can end up having a uh, their their emission split in such a way that <clears throat> the right and left circular become split in frequency in a way that's proportional to what the magnetic field is at the emitting source of the emission. And so this happens for uh, molecules and atoms that are free radicals that have uh, a very specific type of, uh, of spectral uh, signature. And so uh, you can see this in the 1420 megahertz 21 centimeter line from hydrogen. There's a there's a, a molecule out in space called hydroxyl, which is H and O. So it's like H2O with one of the oxygens ripped off. Um, and then there are um, there are a number of radio recombination lines that will also display the same on effect. And uh, you can see the signature in the circular polarization or Stokes V spectrum as a little S curve on its side uh, because the right circular has gone one way, the left circular has gone the other. And when you take the difference, you end up with a little S on its side. So that's the little fingerprint that's get, that gets left. So <clears throat> this method reveals the, the in situ magnetic field in the neutral ISM. Um, and you can probe it's uh, you can probe the magnetic field and strength and direction, and it's complementary to Faraday rotation because that that pro, uh, that probes ionized magnetized plasma magnetic field, whereas the Zeeman effect will get you the neutral component, and it's completely limited by sensitivity. So you need long integrations to to get the results, um, and if you could have a back end and front end system or receiver that gave you a big chunk of the wavelength or a frequency spectrum. Uh, there's the potential to get other spectral lines simultaneously and get very deep integrations on those and learn more about the interstellar medium in various phases, not just the neutral atomic, but also the neutral molecular or even the ionized medium. So I'll tell you a bit about the Galt upgrade here. And so what did we do? We went out and we got new eyes for the telescope. So we got the world's most sensitive radio astronomical receiver at 1420 megahertz. This was uh, designed for the Meerkat telescope in South Africa, an SKA Pathfinder. And right here at uh, Hertzberg uh, Astrophysics, we actually made custom made these low noise amplifiers that, uh, designed, that were designed for this telescope. Um, the old brain uh, was a mishmash of 1960s through 1990s technology. And so many racks of this analog and digital uh, electronics produced uh, the ability to look at one spectral line over 512 channels and a range of only four megahertz of the, the band of uh, radio frequency. And so um, we have removed that and designed a new brain. And this new brain uses technology designed for Chime. And so it uses a uh, FPGA uh, board and, and graphical processing units. And now we're able to look at a number of spectral lines, uh, dozens and dozens of spectral lines across this frequency band that uh, that front end looks at, which is one to two, basically one to two gigahertz, uh, which we call L band in radio astronomy. Now, all of these spectral lines just happen to exhibit the Zeeman effect. So they're all potential probes of studying magnetic fields in space. And so this new system uh, will give us a 20 fold upgrade in the bandwidth, 125 fold upgrade in potential spectral lines to look at and an 18,000 fold upgrade in the number of channels available. And we're looking at 100 Hertz resolution for a reason I'll mention shortly. But the idea is that we plan to map the 21 centimeter Zeeman splitting throughout the Milky Way using the 21 centimeter line, which is uh, ubiquitous, it's everywhere, right? 
Uh, so we can do things like look at the H1 from something called Smith's cloud. So a number of Faraday rotation measures uh, have shown that there's a magnetic field towards this cloud. And it would be nice to, and those were probing the ionized medium around that cloud. It'd be nice to look in the neutral component and see if there's a magnetic field there. Uh, another thing we can look at is the hydroxyl molecule. So hydroxyl was discovered in the interstellar medium. Uh, this is an oxygen with a hydrogen uh, using a telescope that looks almost identical to the 26 meter because they were made by the same manufacturer. This one was in uh, at the Lincoln Laboratory uh, run by MIT in Massachusetts. And so this discovery was made in 1963. And it's still being used today to probe the interstellar medium. It has a complex uh, electronic uh, ro rotational vibrational structure. And so down here, we can see that there's some 18 centimeter emission as well as infrared uh, emission up here. But this 18 centimeter emission shows up in the form of four spectral lines. Uh, 1720, 1612, 1665, and 1667 megahertz, which are right near the 21 centimeter line and observable with the new GALT system. So one of the things we'd like to do is try to map out the uh, hydroxyl in, uh, in the Milky Way. And one of the key points of that new back end uh, is, oops, uh, is that, or one of the key points of the Zeeman effect rather, uh, is that studying uh, that that involves long integrations. So you get deep sensitive observations of whatever other spectral lines you're going to get. So uh, we'll have sensitivity uh, to high, you know, uh, weak or faint hydroxyl throughout the Milky Way as we're probing the, char the characteristics of things like these complex structures in 21 centimeter emission throughout the Milky Way. So these are some GBT H1 maps made at high latitudes or mid latitudes. <clears throat> uh, hydroxyl also has another weird thing uh, that was discovered in uh, 1965. Here's Harold Weaver and an 85 foot telescope in Hat Creek run by the University of California. And so they discovered that there was some type of emission coming from the, the source Westerhout 3 uh, at 1665, but it was way too narrow in width and frequency width to be physical. It's not coming from a thermal emission of this, this molecule. And so they ended up calling this stuff mysterium. Well, it turned out, you know, that was 1965 uh, in October. And not too long, by the end of the month, another nature paper showed up pointing out that this probably wasn't mysterium at all. This was just uh, OH that was acting like a laser at microwave regime. And so they called this microwave lasers or masers. And so <clears throat> this stuff uh, also showed polarization. And uh, they determined that, in fact, that was probably coming from the Zeeman effect. And they were right. And so we can see very easily, here's an 18 meter telescope on site that we call the dish verification antenna. Uh, <clears throat> and some observations with that, clearly in a 15 minute observation, we clearly see Zeeman splitting towards the source W3. So we will do similar things with the, the Galt telescope. And eventually this 18 meter dish will be absorbed into operations at site and we can do similar things or uh, other science projects with it. The neat thing about these masers is that for reasons that are complex and not, I think not terribly well understood, they uh, track the magnetic fields towards these dense sources, track the large scale magnetic fields seen in rotation measures. You, may not, you might not assume that because why would this turbulent thing of star formation where these masers are occurring, remember the ma large scale magnetic field that, that surrounds it or from which these uh, stars are forming, but somehow it does. And so by studying these, we stand to learn about the magnetic field uh, distribution in our Milky Way. Um, there's an interesting uh, topic called Dickey super radiance. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rajabi uh, got her, her PhD at Western with uh, Martin Oud, and they are studying transitions that also produce maser lines 
but they think that there's some type of quantum behavior, quantum mechanical coherent behavior that causes uh, this super radiance in astrophysics. And they would like to study that with the Galt telescope. Um, the, you know, what's past is new again. Uh, there's great interest in doing uh, pulsar scintillation to study the ionized interstellar medium. Wei Li Pen's interested in doing that with the GALT and the Algonquin telescope using VLBI. Another neat thing is radio recombination lines. What's happening here? Here you have an electronic level for hydrogen. And so there are a number of series that can occur. We're probably all familiar with H alpha from basic physics where you go N3 to two and you create 656 nanometer light, visible light. Well, way up here at the energy levels that are way up near basically almost ionized, if you have an ionized uh, electron that comes back and connects or recombines with hydrogen, it can make, it can be like a bus that stops at various bus stops all the way back to home. And at each of these levels that it jumps through from N105, 104, 103, 102, it will emit a radio photon. And so that ends up looking something like this. You can end up having at each of these bus stops, you can have hydrogen emitting a radio line and it creates a comb of them, many, many of them, dozens across uh, a one gigahertz band. And so we have the potential, even though you may see a very weak emission, you can stack dozens and dozens of these things. And we just successfully did that with the Galt telescope weeks ago uh, while commissioning 400 to 800 megahertz. One of the interesting things you could do then, here's an image of an H alpha, this is visible light H alpha map called WAM. And uh, this all sky map has the same uh, spatial resolution as what the Galt telescope would see about half a degree or so. And so you could go to these ionized, these features are creating ionized visible light. You could then use the Galt telescope to do long dwells and look for radio ionization features from these radio recombination lines to learn about the ionized medium at radio. And a nice thing is that we expect same on splitting from those radio lines in the same, uh, the same level as the 21 centimeter line. So I'll wrap it up here uh, and, and hand over to Tom. The new brain, these are the key characteristics. You can come back and visit this or email me if you want to know more about it. And uh, some other potential projects that, you know, off the top of the head, uh, OH maser variability monitoring is a big thing around the world. There's a whole network of telescopes that do this. These, these masers do change uh, sometimes on the order of hours or days. And so that's one potential. Uh, H1 absorption. So pulsar emission could absorb, uh, you could have H1 absorbing that emission as a background source and uh, you can improve pulsar distances that way. Uh, Chime FRBs uh, detect, uh, they're detected multiple a day, uh, but you know, Chime only sees the meridian. And so it would have to wait 24 hours to see that position again. So you could do immediate follow-up to look for repeating signals with the 26 meter uh, if you detect these FRBs. And of course, if you guys have any ideas of your own, that you'd like to try to pursue, get in contact with us and we can try to come up with a plan. And uh, I will leave that there. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Tom, I think if you wanna take the floor and I guess we can hold off questions till the end. Um, I think that'll probably work best. Um, sure, um, I'm sharing the screen and uh, I hope it's looking good so you, far. You can you can see the the title that's, page, can you? Yes, that's yes. perfect. Well, thanks, Tim. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I think I'm talking about a lot of similar physics as I describe opportunities with the synthesis telescope. You see part of the synthesis telescope here. I will be describing the renewal of this telescope that's now going on. Um, the telescope's been around for a long time. It's been around, the first light was just under 50 years ago. Um, it's a small telescope. It's seven antennas. Each one's eight and a half meters diameter. They're stretched out east-west on a 600 meter baseline. And that gives us the ability 
to make images with arc minute resolution at two frequencies, at 1420 megahertz, which is the frequency of the, the H1 line, the, the atomic hydrogen line, and at 408 megahertz. Now, why, you might ask, is there any point in having this little telescope in the era of the square kilometre array? The square kilometre array is going to be thousands of, of antennas, rather like the ones shown here, stretched out right across the continent of Africa, have incredible sensitivity and enormous resolution. What's the point of a little telescope in Canada? Well, the answer is that this little telescope is a superb telescope for imaging large structure. And this telescope does things which other telescopes, the VLA um, and other big telescopes cannot do, uh, and does things which the new telescopes, Square Kilometre Array and the NGVLA will not be able to do. We have small antennas. Small antennas have big fields of view. Small antennas can be moved close together and short interferometer baselines portray big things. Well, what's big and interesting? Our galaxy. And much as Tim has described, I'm going to focus on the astrophysics of our galaxy. Um, well, who cares about the astrophysics of our galaxy? Well, galaxies are the basic building block of the universe. Um, cosmology was discovered by Hubble hundred years ago by studying galaxies. Um, galaxies are still the probes of the universe. Cosmology today depends very much on observations of galaxies. We live in one. We have the opportunity to study it close up. What we learn there affects every field of astronomy. So the galactic, the galactic system, sure, it's the galaxy, galaxy is full of stars. The stars are very important, but the interstellar medium is also very important. And diffuse interstellar clouds, cool molecules form in them. Inside those molecular clouds, stars become form. And so clearly the interstellar medium is an important thing in the life of the galaxy. But those stars in turn ionize their surroundings, they have stellar winds, but the big ones among them blow up as supernova explosions. So there's a return of radiation and of matter to the interstellar medium. And there's the whole enrichment of the interstellar medium with heavy elements. And as all these arrows indicate, this is a process that goes around and round, and we describe that as the galactic ecosystem. It's a nice analogy to, to think about. Um, and so the synthesis telescope has always focused very much on this sort of thing. Uh, it's had many upgrades in its life. Um, the biggest scientific impact of the telescope was probably the Galactic Plane Survey. We spent 13 years imaging the entire strip of the Milky Way that's accessible to us. Uh, and Graduate students played a huge role in that. We produced 22 MSc degrees and 14 PhDs, and we employed 11 postdocs. So the synthesis telescope has had a big impact on the Canadian radio astronomy community. And a lot of the people in faculty positions today started their research careers with the synthesis telescope. And what are we doing with it today? Um, well, we're replacing essentially everything except the steel work. This is underway now. Uh, the development and upgrade will, are being done in these three years, last year, this year, next year, and commissioning will start in 2024. The renewal has three thrusts. We're going to build a forefront science instrument we're going to build a test bed in where new engineering technology, new radio astronomy technology can be tried out. And we're going to build a wonderful instrument for graduate student training. 
And I want to emphasize that, of course, that's what this talk is about. Um, commissioning starts in 2024. There's an opportunity for graduate students to learn the skills of aperture synthesis techniques. This is a telescope that's here in Canada. It's easy to get at. You can actually put your hands on this telescope. It's not in the remote Western Australian desert where the low frequency SKA will be built where you will never be allowed to go anywhere near it. And you will never be allowed to go anywhere near the SKA. This is a telescope you can touch. That's a big difference. What are we doing? Um, well, as I said, we're replacing everything but the steel work. Um, and everything here is new from the front end, from the feed, which collects the radiation right to the correlator. Uh, and when I say it's new, I mean it's new. Um, we are inventing this stuff. There's, there's world-class engineering going into every box here, um, except of course, optical fiber. We're not inventing optical fiber. We're going out and buying that. But the rest is, is new and innovative. Um, for example, the wide band feed that collects the signals for this telescope from 400 to 1800 megahertz is the work of Xuan Du, who gained his PhD in engineering from UBC for this work in 2021. Um, the low noise amplifiers are a graduate student project from the University of Calgary in 2018, and on and on. Now, to compare the old with the new, the old telescope looked at two narrow bands, 1420 megahertz where the hydrogen line is, uh, and wire band at 408 megahertz. And we will now span essentially the whole frequency range from 400 to 1800 megahertz. I'm sure there's a little gap in the middle, but um, that's intentional because that's full of cell phone signals. Um, what will we do in this band? Um, well, Tim's laid a lot of groundwork here. We'll be looking at the atomic hydrogen. We'll be looking at the molecular lines of, of the hydroxyl radical. And we'll be looking at recombination lines. We've got plenty of recombination lines. Um, I'll give a little introduction to some of these fields, which will supplement what Tim has so ably outlined there. Um, alas, we live in the era of radio communications, radio frequency interference. We can't use every frequency that the telescope will be sensitive to, but we can use a lot of it. Here down at the low end, you see there's a lot of garbage here from cell phones and uh, around 550, 600 megahertz, that's television and the lower end around 400 megahertz of various communications things, the police and the, the power grid, and they use bands there. But we can use, there are a lot of frequencies there we can use. Um, having these spectral lines gives us access to a lot of the ecosystem of the galaxy, the atomic gas, the molecular gas, the ionized gas. And the part I haven't talked about yet, the polarization mapping, the non-thermal component, the magnetic fields, and the relativistic electrons. So here you're seeing something from the Galactic Plane Survey. This is imaging of atomic hydrogen. It's a 20 degree by eight degree field. And we're looking at the Perseus arm of the galaxy, clearly a very dynamic uh, environment everything that's going on here. Before the galactic plane survey, before our galactic plane survey, there were no images like this. Um, really groundbreaking stuff. We'll be able to do more of that over more fields. And recently with the line of atomic hydrogen, Rebecca Booth from Calgary in her MSc pioneered a new technique um, which is to use atomic hydrogen as an absorber to di discover the distances to things. In the case of this supernova remnant BA530, she was using not 
the total emission, but the polarized emission. I don't have time to go into all the details, but there are many advantages to using the polarized emission. You get an unambiguous distance determination. If there's absorption of the emission in this H1 cloud, then you know that the object is behind the H1 cloud, more distant. And Rebecca was able to pick up an absorption out here all the way to minus 67 kilometers per second, uh, which implies a distance greater than 4.7 kiloparsecs. The previous best distance for this object was 2.2 kiloparsecs. So now clearly we understand a lot more about this supernova remnant. Um, the, physic, the physics of these things are proportional to the distance squared. So if you've got the distance wrong by more than a factor of two, you've got the physics very wrong. Now we can understand this, this thing. Um, this is a new technique pioneered with the existing telescope, but one that we will use a lot with a new telescope. Um, Tim has already talked about recombination lines. Everybody knows H-alpha, which is prominent recombination line. And Tim has also, also shown this diagram at the lower right, which shows how close together the recombinations are, lines are in the two to 10 gigahertz range. But um, down at 400 megahertz, they're spaced really close together. They're spaced by 1.8 megahertz. Um, sorry, and a, a very old plot, similar to the one Tim showed. Uh, interesting how we're talking about the same things. Um, very prominent in the middle is a recombination line of hydrogen, an alpha line, but there are also beta lines uh, of hydrogen and much lower intensity helium lines, an alpha line of helium, um, and a carbon recombination line. Um, we have potentially 90 transitions available in, in our past band. As we stack them together, we enhance the sensitivity. If we stack half of them, assuming that half of them are blotted out by interference, if we can stack half of them, we'll get a 13 millikelvin sensitivity, which is comparable with existing surveys of Arecibo and GBT. And we can then survey the outer plane of the Milky Way. And the things we learn there are dynamics of H2 regions, kinematic distances, the structure of the galaxy, um, and possibly it may be challenging, we may be able to have the sensitivity to the helium and carbon recombination lines. Now with arc minute resolution, so really high angular resolution on H2 regions, which, which can be degrees in diameter. Um, the OH molecules, yes, Tim has already explained the physics here. Um, complementary to Tim's observations of the Zeeman effect, um, we will do a survey in the outer galaxy for, for maser emission. Uh, we probably won't have the sensitivity, unfortunately, to see um, hydroxyl molecules in thermal equilibrium, but we certainly have the sensitivity to see maser emissions. Um, a lot of this comes from OHIR stars, which are late stage stars where the molecules condense from the stellar wind and, and they can be pumped by the abundant infrared that's available there. Um, another application here is to search for shocked, shock excited um, OH in the 1720 line in supernova remnants. Um, lots many opportunities here. Um, back for the last part of my talk to the galactic ecosystem. The diagram I, didn't, I showed before didn't show the hidden component, which is the magnetic field. And the magnetic field stores a lot of energy. In fact, it stores 
more energy than the kinetic motion of the gases. All the, all the atomic, hydrogen, atomic hydrogen movie I showed you earlier, there's more energy in the magnetic field than there is in the kinetic motion of the gas. And um, where's the energy comes from, come from? Well, it, it's, it comes from galactic rotation and the magnetic field builds up through dynamo effects. Um, and our probe of the magnetic field, of magnetic fields right across the universe is from synchrotron radio emission where electrons spiral around magnetic field lines and the synchrotron emission emerges with linear polarization that's perpendicular to the magnetic field at origin. But when we map the sky in polarization, we've, we've already done some of this with the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey. I'm showing polarized intensity in the top very colorful images and uh, showing total intensity in the top images and polarized intensity in the lower images. You see first that the polarized sky looks completely different from the total intensity sky. You will see that the top images, the temperature scales are up to 20 Kelvin on the left-hand side and about 10 Kelvin on the right-hand side, whereas the polarized intensity is only about half a Kelvin. So the fraction of the signal which is polarized is quite low. So this is a technically challenging field. But why is the sky, why does the sky look so different through these two windows? It's because of Faraday rotation. Tim's touched on this too. Thanks, Tim. You're, you're a wonderful physics teacher. Um, Faraday rotation is proportional to wavelength squared, to electron density, and to magnetic field. So it's a very powerful probe of the magnetized plasma, the ionized medium, the magneto-ionic medium, which fills the, the galaxy. Um, and the important thing to measure, to remember here, is not wavelength, but wavelength squared. And the unit of rotation measure is radians per square meter. And it's possible to map the magnetic field in the Milky Way by looking at extra galactic synchrotron emitters and see what happens to their radiation as they come through the, uh, the galactic magneto-ionic medium. And Joanne Brown pioneered this with the Galactic Plane Survey many years ago in her PhD. Um, on the before image is top left, the after image is bottom left. We know a lot more now than we knew before. And from that, Joanne and her collaborators have made this plot of the Milky Way magnetic field. It follows the spiral arms. It's all clockwise, except for the very puzzling phenomenon of the magnetic field reversal in the Sagittarius arm. So that's what we've learned from looking at it. At polarized sources beyond the Milky Way, seeing how their radiation propagates through the Milky Way. And in that situation, shown in this top picture, it's pretty simple. The, the source of the emission is outside the galaxy and the rotating medium is inside the galaxy and we have the rotation measure, it's a simple number. But when the source of the emission and the rotation are mixed, things get more complicated. From the back of this box, the emission is rotated right through the box. So it suffers a lot of Faraday rotation. From the middle of the box, the middle arrow, I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, um, the radiation only suffers half as much Faraday rotation. From the front of the box, it suffers no Faraday rotation. So the telescope, receives a very complicated signal. There is not one value of rotation measure, there are many. So we have to use a different parameter, which we call Faraday depth. And they certainly don't have time to go 
can do all the arithmetic, all the mathematics there. But as Tim alluded, we have used the Galt telescope to map Faraday depth with 40 arc minute resolution. And we're going to move on to the renewed synthesis telescope and do it with a few arc minute resolution. A few details. With a Galt telescope, over the whole sky, we have a total intensity map. This is a familiar map of the galactic emission. On the right hand lower picture is Faraday depth. And you can see Faraday depth of different signs, which means the negative means the Faraday, it means the magnetic field's pointing away from us. Red or positive means the magnetic field is pointing towards us. These are things we didn't know before. And again, I'll show this movie. This is the first application ever of RM synthesis, the single antenna polarimetry. Until we did this, nobody knew that there was emission at different Faraday depths. We are really, uh, we're getting a new window here on the interstellar medium. And the renewed synthesis telescope will be extremely powerful. On the bottom in red, I've depicted the bands the two bands we have. In the top in blue, I've translated their frequencies to the wavelength squared domain. Remember, it's wavelength squared that matters here. So it's interesting that the, the lower band, which is a smaller piece of frequency space, uh, occupies the much bigger area of wavelength space. And the top band occupies the smaller part of the wavelength squared domain. But both are important. The, the short wavelengths are important for our ability to see large structures in Faraday depth. And the long wavelengths, the low frequencies are, frequencies are important to get the high resolution in Faraday depth. Um, so the, the galactic, the, the global magnetoionic ionic medium survey the project we have running now, the acronym is horrible, it's GMIMS. Uh, it's an international project. We've gone all over the world. We've used single antenna radio telescopes and we're doing the whole sky, north and south. We've used the Galt telescope. We've used the Parkes 64 meter telescope. We're using CHIME and we're using the small offset reflector at DREO. We have an angular resolution of about a degree. But with a renewed telescope, we're going to expand our acronym. We're going to expand our, our, um, our abilities. And we will look at the magnetoionic medium on small scales. And we will be able to map the magnetic field on the scale of stellar winds, of, of supernova remnants, um, we will be able to probe the role of magnetic field in all those processes. We have opportunities in GMIMS for graduate students now. We will have abundant opportunities for graduate students as we move to the next step. So, thank you. Thank you for listening to me talk about my favorite telescope. Thank you very much, Tom. That was extremely interesting. Um, so first, I want to say thank you both very much to Men Tom for taking time out of your day. I'm sure quite busy, especially now uh, with all of these massive upgrades going on. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk and specifically focusing on graduate student opportunities. So with that, I'd love to leave the floor open to see if there are any questions from members of the audience. Um, if, if you have one, you can either raise your hand uh, or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself or type the question in the chat. Well, I'll stop sharing and then you can have speaker view. And while we're waiting to see if anybody else has any other questions, I did have a question uh, for Tim. Um, I don't recall what was the deadline for these upgrades, these major upgrades to the Gold Telescope. Uh, we are working on that this week. We have a strong deadline that will uh, 